Well, let me, uh, well, let me first thank Cole for, the, uh, for inviting me to speak and talk with everyone this afternoon. Um, and, um, and I want to thank all of you for um, never giving up uh, and for, um, you know, remaining active and, uh, and hopeful in a time, quite frankly, when it's easy to just, <laughs> you know, cover your face with your hands and say, ugh, you know, um, it's, it's not an easy time uh, in the country. It's not an easy time in the world. And, um, you know, coming here today, uh, I also want to uh, pay special tribute to a friend I know of many in this room, certainly a friend of mine who recently passed away, Michael True, uh, who, um, as long as I can remember growing up here in Worcester, whether through op-eds or letters to the editor or peaceful vigils or, you know, or making good trouble at speeches, uh, uh, he was always a voice for justice and peace. And uh, we, we, we remember him today and we think of him and we certainly honor his uh, his years of uh, dedication to the efforts of peace and justice. Um, you know, I, I asked, well, we, we, I, we reached out to Cole to try to figure out, like, what we should talk about. And there are so many issues, and Cole kind of mentioned a lot of those issues that it would take a doctoral thesis to cover. Um, and um, I want to point out that I don't have a doctorate. Uh, but I, I did have, I did receive a couple honorary degrees, so I'll try to do the best I can to get through as many of these uh, issues as possible. Um, but I thought I'd begin um, by making, highlighting what I'm sure you have been talking about all day, and that uh, you know this really is a time like no other. And we've been through some, <laughs> you know, when you look over the years and I look over my lifetime, there have been moments when you know you just kind of wonder what the hell's going on, um, and uh, we're at a moment where. I, I find myself saying that uh, not only daily, but hourly. And um, because if we don't stand up and we don't provide uh, a sensible alternative or help people feel comfortable with another way, uh, we can find ourselves in a situation that will be hard to reverse. So I thought I would begin first by describing some things that have been taking up my time in Congress in the last, uh, over the last couple of months and then end with the more you know, general question of the ups and downs kind of of the peace and progressive movement right now. And then I want to leave plenty of time for questions and comments because um, you know, I, I want to learn from you and I want to hear what's on your mind. Um, and quite frankly, that's more important than what I'm about to, about to say. Uh, so um, uh, first, um, you know, Cole mentioned the issue in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, for the life of me, don't know why there's not more outrage in the United States Congress, but also throughout the country over the fact that we continue to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. Um, I co-chair the Human Rights Commission in Congress. We do hearings on human rights issues all over the world. The situation in Saudi is amongst the worst in the world. Um, we know all about the horrors of what's happening in Yemen, um, where the Saudis are bombing school buses, weddings, funerals, um, you know, innocent people. Uh, all those bombs, by the way, say made in the USA on them. Uh, we know um, we know the fact that uh, you know people who are engaged in any kind of not only peaceful dissent but any questioning of the Saudi government are routinely arrested uh, and are tortured. Uh, and we all know the case of Jamal Khashoggi, um, who was murdered in a Saudi council in a consulate in um, in Turkey uh, and was dismembered. And we don't know where his body is. And we do know, based on our intelligence sources including intelligence from this administration's intelligence sources, that the Crown Prince, uh, who is Jared Kushner's best friend, uh, you know, was very much responsible for that murder. And yet, there are no consequences. And yet, we can't even put a freeze or a hold on U.S. military uh, weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. So I introduced a bill, uh, Cole mentioned, H.R. 643, that would end all U.S. arms sales and military aid to Saudi Arabia. And if the president, this president, or any other president wanted to continue it, he or she would have to come to Congress and have to ask us to vote affirmatively uh, to uh, allow those sales to go forward. But to, uh, well, thank you. Yeah. And um, We have a lot of bills that are moving their way through the Foreign Affairs Committee dealing with Saudi Arabia. Mine is one of them. Um, and, um, but I, I, I don't think it is sufficient anymore to simply pass a sense of Congress resolution to say we're upset. Um, I, I think the only thing that the Saudi government will understand uh, is a concrete action. And by the way, I'm not just talking about 
influencing the Saudi government, um, I want other governments that we are allied with, uh, where we sell and provide military assistance or weapons to understand uh, that, uh, that there is a limit uh, to the patience uh, and to the tolerance of the American people. If we don't do this, then I, I don't think we have much moral authority to speak about human rights anywhere else in the world. Um, and I, you know, I, look, I mean, we, we have adversaries that have terrible human rights records, and I believe that we all have an obligation to speak up for those who are persecuted, but you can't just talk about the record of our, uh, human rights record of our adversaries. You have to talk about the human rights record of our friends, too. We have to be consistent, otherwise our words don't mean anything. Second, I'm also the, I'm proud to have introduced a resolution on April 10th to call for the elimination of nuclear weapons and for the U.S. to embrace the goals and provisions of the treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And um, Vicki has been a big part of that. And, um, and I, I, the bill is H-Res 302. We introduced it with my good friend from Oregon, Earl Blumenauer, who has long been considered a leader in Congress on the fight to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, is also is very much a Massachusetts homegrown bill. Um, you know, Vicki has been a big part of uh, this push, as has um, you know our, our, my, our friend uh, Ira Helfand, uh, and his back from the Brink campaign has played a role in drafting this. Um, uh, we need to get co-sponsors on this, um, and you know, don't tell any of my colleagues in the delegation, but we need to get more Massachusetts yes. members on this as well, um, and. Um, you know, Congress, the, the resolution that we've introduced, I think is an important complement to some other bills that I know that you support and I've co-sponsored, uh, H.R. 669, that's Congressman Ted Lou's bill to prohibit the U.S. from a first strike, uh, from, from a first nuclear weapon strike. And then we have another bill introduced by Congressman Lou to prevent, that would prohibit the research, development, and deployment of low-yield nuclear weapons, for example, the, uh, the Trident D5. So I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of all these bills. Uh, and then there's Adam Smith's, uh, Congressman Adam Smith's bill to prohibit the United States from first use of nuclear weapons, uh, which have also co-sponsors. Look, at all of these bills are important. Um, and uh, we need to get co-sponsors numbers up uh, because, um, you know, we are in charge now in the House. And I think it is a lot easier to bring things to the floor um, if our leadership believes that, that people really want it to come to the floor. And the only way to be able to demonstrate that is through advocacy and through getting more co-sponsors. So uh, I also want to say that uh, all of us are working together to uh, stop and to limit the trillion dollar so-called modernization of our nuclear arsenal. Um, <clears throat> I love President Obama, but this started <laughs> under his administration um, and it is now on steroids under this administration. Uh, but we, we, we need to be working to reduce nuclear weapons, and we need to be we also need to be moved to, moving toward eliminating them, not upgrading and creating a new nuclear arsenal. Um, and we ought to make it comfortable in our political vocabulary to talk about the elimination of nuclear weapons. So, um, I want to also mention a, a couple of peace and human rights issues that we've been working on over the past couple of weeks, and I hope that you'll be engaged on. You know, around the world, uh, working for peace and human rights is a very dangerous thing to do. And individuals, local leaders, and NGOs receive death threats uh, by, for standing up for peace and human rights. Uh, they're sent to prison, they're deported, they are murdered, or they simply disappear. Uh, so when something amazing happens, I think we need to stand up and support it. Uh, in Sudan, for example, uh, in the past five months, the people of Sudan all over the country have been protesting peacefully and calling for a new, inclusive, democratic, and civilian-led government. And they have forced Omar al-Bashir to leave office after ruling as a dictator for over 30 years. He's now under house arrest. Um, and as somebody who's been arrested three times in front of the Sudanese embassy protesting their genocide, I am thrilled uh, that maybe he might face some accountability. But freedom and the future of Sudan are on the line. The Sudanese military want to be in control. Uh, but right now, uh, they have to bargain with the wave of civil society that has taken over the streets and are, are calling for freedom and change. So right now, I'm circulating a, a bipartisan letter addressed to Secretary of State Pompeo, calling on the United States to stand with the Sudanese people. Uh, the letter is open for signature through the, the rest of this week. Um, you know, we have over 60 bipartisan members. Uh, we could use your help with getting some members on there. 
uh, but it's important because at this amazing moment, uh, it is very possible if the world is not paying attention, the Sudanese military will solidify control and really nothing will have changed uh, other than the name of the person who's running the show. Uh, people there have suffered so much, they have experienced the genocide. Um, it is time that they have a future uh, where, they can, where, where, where people can determine their future. And another letter that I'm circulating right now in the House is to support the Colombian Peace Accords and to protect human rights defenders and social leaders in Colombia. Uh, I've spent an awful lot of time uh, on trying to push for peace in Colombia, uh, just like I did during the 1980s, like many of you did in El Salvador. Uh, bottom line is that um, there's a peace accord. It has to be implemented. Uh, we have a new president of Colombia who I don't think is, is committed to the peace process as we would expect he would be, and so we need to keep the pressure on. Because the fact is, right now, a Colombian social leader is murdered every two days. Uh, they are being slaughtered. And Colombia's new president, President Duque, is, in my opinion, trying to undermine the peace accords by changing provisions, by slow walking implementation, and providing very little funding uh, you know, uh, to carry out the many complex reforms that are needed to achieve peace. Uh, the peace agreement uh, ended a nearly 60 year civil war, uh, the longest in the history of the hemisphere. Uh, but now it's in danger. And I think that unless we are loud and vocal about this, um, you know, that, it's, it, that our government will not be um, demanding the Colombians uh, abide by the uh, agreement. So I have a letter with John Lewis and Jan Schakowsky that we're circulating to, uh, to try to uh, in insist uh, that future U.S. Uh, support is going to be determined, is going to be conditioned on whether or not this, uh, this, is, uh, this peace agreement is implemented. So we need help on that. Uh, and also in Israel. Um, you know, I, uh, I co-chair the Human Rights Commission, um, and I have learned over the years uh, to believe uh, legitimate human rights defenders and human rights workers who are deployed in some of the most dangerous parts of the world. Um, and sometimes they, I mean, almost always they report the truth, and sometimes it's uncomfortable truth, and sometimes it's horrific truth. Uh, but in Israel, uh, right now, uh, the government is about to deport Omar Shakir, who is the director of the Israel and West Bank Office on, uh, of Human Rights Watch. Uh, I have met with uh, Omar. Um, I mean, I, he just, uh, I mean, he is what you want a human rights defender to be, a human rights worker to be. I mean, totally uh, not political, but just the facts, like that, like, Dragnet, the facts, only the facts. That's where he comes from. That, that's it. That you got it, you got it. And um, so, some of us, uh, 17 of us, have reached out to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, asking him to reverse his decision. Um, you know, I've, I, I contacted about two dozen members of, of Congress who I know who have been concerned about the, the human rights issues and humanitarian issues in the Middle East. Um, who have met with Omar when he was um, in, in Washington and who, they're familiar with the Human Rights Watch work in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. Um, and, you know, we had only a few days to get this turned around because his deportation is imminent. Um, and I'm grateful to many members who responded so quickly. Um, to those who say that, you know, his only purpose is to point out the uh, shortfalls uh, in terms of Israel's human rights policy, I will point out that he has reported as well on the Palestinian Authority's uh, human rights record and the record of Hamas uh, against certain Palestinians. And he has been critical there as well. This is not a guy who's engaged in a political fight. He is there basically to talk about human rights. Uh, and Human Rights Watch is one of the most foremost human rights organizations in the world. Uh, and, I th and, and we are hoping that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu may reconsider uh, the deportation. Because if he doesn't, I mean, again, we're setting these dangerous precedents. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important in the peace movement is to be able to have access to the facts and the reality. And when you block people from coming in and doing legitimate human rights work, you make it more difficult to have a sensible, thoughtful, and honest conversation on how we resolve some of the conflicts. Uh, and let me just say, Finally, we'll open this up to whatever you want to talk about, because I know you've hit, bro broken up into a whole bunch of groups and there's a lot on your mind. Um, so we have, we have a challenge, uh, kind of in the progressive peace movement, uh, and that is how to fight for our convictions, but also how, how to move the ball forward. 
Um, and it's a lot more, it's harder to do than it sounds uh, because uh, we feel strongly about a lot of things. Um, and, um, but as legislation moves forward, as appropriations bills moves forward, um, we are not, um, you know, we have to understand that in the, now that we're in the majority, at the end of the day, we, we, have to, we have to pass appropriations bills. And there's two ways to pass appropriations bills, either bills that kind of lean to our side, and if we can't get our side to support them, if there's legitimate progress in them, then the other way is to pass appropriation bills that lead to more conservative and more to more, more hawkish side. And, and this is an important point, because uh, Cole talked about the budget, and, uh, and I'm, I, I'm a little frustrated with the whole budget process for this reason. Um, we are not gonna get the budget with regard to the military that I think I would, vote, would like. Um, but we, because I don't think we have the votes to do so. But we can get a budget that is more in tune with what we believe in terms of our military priorities, in terms of peace priorities, and a budget that maybe increases dramatically uh, the amount we invest in domestic spending and in programs to help the poor, programs to help rebuild our country, and programs to help feed hungry people here uh, and around the world. Uh, and so we're gonna have to be pretty agile, and we're gonna have to be a little bit more sophisticated uh, in how we conduct ourselves. Uh, the victory that some of us think we got uh, was really not much of a victory, because what we got was uh, not a, a debate on a budget, you know, where we say this is what the military budget should be and this is what the domestic budget should be. What we got was a top line number of how much we're gonna spend as a government. And the determination of how that is gonna be split up will be determined really by the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee. She will decide what the allocations are for each committee. Now, she's a good person, and I think she's very sympathetic to what we all care about, but I think I much would rather have had brought something to the floor and had a more thorough debate. But we are where we are. So now the issue is going to be, you know, is there, you know, how do we pass these bills? Uh, and how do we pass these bills so they're better than they, they were in the last Congress um, and they move our, our agenda forward? And so we're gonna have to make some tough decisions uh, along the way. I'm just being honest with you, where you're not gonna get the perfect bill. Um, but maybe we can get a perfect debate. And maybe we will be able to test where people are on some of these issues. So I'm the chairman of the Rules Committee now. Yay, you know, anyway, so anyway. I, 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 and so, in the, in, in, you know, one of my critiques about the previous uh, leadership in Congress was that the Rules Committee became the place where democracy went to die. So if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to bring an amendment to the floor, you know, on the AUMF, or if I wanted to bring a bill to the floor challenging a weapon system, um, or if I wanted to bring a bill, uh, an amendment to the floor, you know, that would reduce the military budget or whatever like that, they would block me. Right? So we're not going we're not, we're not to do any blocking uh, when it comes to progressive priorities. You know, we're going to have these debates, and we're going to give people in the House an honest opportunity to vote up or down on where their priorities are. And so we're gonna, we, we, we need to be, I think initially, we, we need to be selective in which, what we bring to the floor, because we don't want to bring a thousand things to the floor, because we need people to focus and lobby, and we, need to move, you know, we, need to, we want to move the agenda forward. But I will tell you, when it all is said and done, based on the makeup of the House, which is a narrow majority for Democrats, including a lot of conservative Democrats, um, it's not gonna be perfect. Um, and we're gonna have to decide whether it's perfect enough to be able to advance it or not, and have to have a debate about if we don't advance some of these things, what does it mean? Now, how all this plays out I'm, remains to be seen, but I think we're gonna have to be agile enough and flexible enough to be able to have these discussions um, as we move as we move forward. Um, now, the, I just want a couple other final things, and I'll open this for questions. I mean, Cole in, had talked and mentioned in his um, uh, email of that um, you know that people are interested in Medicare for all and, and the climate change issue too, which I think are two major issues. You should know that the Rules Committee 
uh, had the first Medicare for All hearing in the history of Congress uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and here is the remarkable thing. Um, leading up to the hearing, some of my friends on the left thought it was going to be a lousy hearing, and they were saying it must be a conspiracy going on. My friends on the right were saying McGovern's a socialist, and he's just pushing this left-wing agenda and shame on him. And then my friends in the middle were like, why is he even talking about this? I don't want to talk about any of this stuff. <laughs> well, long story short, we had a hearing that was labeled by most of the, of the, of the, of the media as a wonky, thoughtful, surprisingly civil discussion about the merits of Medicare for All. And one of the witnesses we had, we had economists, we had someone who worked at the VA. We, Republicans had witnesses, too, who I disagreed with, but who weren't that bad. I mean, who actually admitted to me in a question that the cost of Medicare for all, um, in which we w it, it would be about the same as what we're spending in health care right now. And I said to the guy, so you mean to tell me we're going to insure more people, we're going to give people more benefits, um, we're going to uh, you know, give senior citizens more benefits for the same price? He says, correct. I said, I can live with that. Right? Um, and we had this wonderful young man named Adi Barkin, who I don't know how many of you know. This is remarkable. He knew, he heard we were doing this hearing. He lives in Santa Barbara, California. He's got ALS. I mean, it's, 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 his body is deteriorating rapidly to the point now where he can no, he can no longer use his voice. It's a synthetic voice. He looks at a, at a machine where he can identify words and then the machine will speak. He emailed the Speaker of the House to see whether she would ask me whether I would allow him to testify. And I said, absolutely. I mean, but it never occurred to me that he could make the trip. And he did, you know, at great risk to his own health. And he came and he testified for almost six hours. Um, and it was, it, it, it was unbelievable. Uh, and, um, and notwithstanding all of his health care challenges, we have a couple of Republicans in the Rules Committee who are, I'm, let me think of the, I'm trying to think of a nice word. I mean, anyway, but who are, who are not always very friendly and civil, who went after him a couple of times. Um, and he had a little bit of a delay, but he went after them too. Um, and, um, and, he, and one of the things he pointed out was that for all the, the good things in the Affordable Care Act, and there were some good things, 21 million people have health insurance, you can't be discriminated against if you have a pre-existing condition, I go on and on and on. But with all that, we still live in a country where there are 20 million, 29 million people without health insurance. And we still have 40 million people who have health insurance that is so inadequate that they're afraid to get sick and afraid to use it because they're afraid they won't be able to afford the, the out-of-pocket expenses. There was an article in a newspaper the other day about a young couple whose baby uh, it had ingested some uh, very heavy medication, right? I mean, um, and they didn't know how much the baby ingested. They took the pill out of the baby's mouth, um, and they called the emergency room, and the emergency room, bring her right away, this is what you need to do, and on and on. And they got to the emergency room, and they waited in their car for hours to see whether there was any adverse effect, whether the baby actually swallowed some of these pills, because they had gone to the emergency room a few months earlier and their bill that they got was so astronomically high, they just couldn't absorb another bill, so they waited to see whether the baby got sick. And the baby, thankfully, did not get sick, but these are the choices that people are, are faced with. We've got to do better. If we, were, if we were designing the healthcare system from scratch, it wouldn't be this, right? So anyway, it was a great hearing. So I want to thank you for your advocacy on that, and uh, a lot of my friends from PDA and others have been you know, pushing on this and pushing on this, and, um, and I'm really proud that the first hearing was good. I was solid and set the groundwork for others, and I think increased the pressure on others' uh, committees to do hearings. The final thing is the is Green New Deal. And look, um, I, you know, I'm a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. I think it's a smart thing to do. Um, you know, we spent eight years doing nothing on the climate crisis. You know, when I became chair of the Rules Committee, we established the first ever, well, not the first ever, we've, we established a special select committee on the climate crisis to complement the work of the other committees. My hope is they're going to come up with some concrete um, suggestions that we can move forward on. We passed a bill that we went through the Rules Committee last week to, to uh, uh, demand that we not exit the Paris Climate Accord. So, I mean, there's a lot that, um, there's a lot 
that we need to do, but here's the, the bottom line. If we don't do something soon, we might as well forget about it. I mean, that's what scientists tell us. So this is it. Um, and what gives me great hope on this is that probably the number one uh, age demographic of people who are showing up at my offices, who are showing up at parades, who are sending me petitions, who are asking me to come to speak, are high school students. Um, I, was, I spoke to a sixth grade class that were more informed about the climate crisis than most of my colleagues. Um, and the fact that we have a president and we still have leaders in the Senate who deny that this is even real, it's, a, it's, it's disgraceful, right? But we, are now, we now are building the mo a, a movement. Uh, my hope is to get us to a point where we can um, get something done. But um, I'll just close again by saying to everybody, I am grateful that you're here. Um, I, I respect the viewpoints of everybody in this, in this audience. Um, sometimes we don't always see quite eye to eye on everything, uh, but, um, but we need to expand the peace movement. We need to grow the peace and justice movement. If ever there was a time, if ever there was a need, it's now. Um, and so um, I will try to be wind at your back, and I appreciate you having me here today. So thank you. So, so if people have questions or... Thank you. Um, it's very energizing uh, to hear all of what you have done. Um, I'm a Korean American, and as a Korean American, I, uh, it stood out when I looked at this uh, legislative agenda that you were uh, sponsoring so many wonderful uh, resolutions, and um, but haven't done so far uh, about the history to end. The Uh, yeah, I certainly support the, uh, the position of the of of that particular party in South Korea that has you know has put forward a, a peace initiative, and I, I support it. I just, I, as a matter of form, and, and, and I'm sure this is not going to please anybody here. I mean, I, the I, the idea of Congress passing legislation to support an initiative by one party in one country just seems to me. I just I'm not terribly comfortable with that. If it came up for a vote, I would certainly vote for it. But I, I would rather have us draft a, an alternative legislation, um, you know, that is, um, that is not about, is, is, is specific in terms of its support for one party's position. And um, because I think, I, I just, I, I just, I'm trying to think of other bills that we have done where we have, where we have done that, and I don't know. But I, look, the situation in North Korea, it can only be resolved through negotiations and through, um, and through, you know, um, compromise. Co co compromise and um, and a um, engagement. engagement. Absolutely, you said. I mean, all this, and, and I, um, and I look at. I can't stand the president, um, but I'm not. I'm, I, I did not criticize him for wanting to reach out to Kim Jong Un. Although, I got to be honest with you, he makes it very difficult because. Um, uh, I don't really, I, I always worry that there's not any substance being talked about, and I also worry that the issue of human rights are never brought up. But having said all of that, if that were to lead to, you know, more discussions and more thoughtful con conversations, engagement, I'm for it. Look, I do not, I, I, I we, we need to avoid wars. And um, so I appreciate it, and I, um, you know, I, this, is, this is just, I'm just a nitpicky rules committee person who, you know. Um, Tim, can I just follow up? Yeah. Bill was written by Ro Khanna and Peace Action helped to write it. I don't think it was written by South No, Korea. I'm not saying it isn't, but it's endorsing one party's, Which one? well, I mean, the, the current president's party, right? I mean, well, yeah. I don't think he's the only one in South Korea. No, well, I, yeah, peace, yeah. Well, I want to negotiate peace, but I'm, to be honest with you, I, I'm uncomfortable with the way the bill was drafted. So we can, we can go over it line by line. I'm happy to do that with you, but I, I support the, the goal. Uh, I have 
Joseph Gerson, and just to really appreciate the leadership and the consistent uh, moral vision that you, you have it and, and, and move to implement. Uh, two things. First of all, I, I work uh, with a thing called the Korea Peace Network, among others, uh, and I'll be going back to Korea in a couple of weeks. Just to say that uh, the People's Solidarity for the Christopher Democracy, which is the largest NGO uh, in, in, in South Korea, which grows out of the uh, democracy uh, struggle in, in, in Korea, has been a leading advocate. And the perception is that uh, negotiating a peace treaty to replace the armistice uh, is, is a way to kind of move the step by step forward. You know, Bolton and Pompeo did, and he was obnoxious to say the least. Uh, and and it's simply to say that it's not just a party, but it's really a very popular position, uh, certainly in, in South Korea. Where I wanted to go was that. Uh, I just started a major international conference in, in New York and brought a couple of Russian dissidents up, up here to, to Boston uh, to get uh, people from Russia to the United States and to have the kind of exchanges that we need that can provide the kind of level of relationships that make make more impossible. possible is extraordinarily difficult right now. It's like a year's wait just for an interview uh, 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 to get a visa. Uh, and I think it's important for uh, members of Congress and others to be beginning to think through what are some common security alternatives, both in relationship to Russia and in relationship to China, if we're going to avoid the kind of great power confrontations uh, where even the nuclear weapons that, are, that we have now uh, might be used. So I'd be curious about your thinking in terms of how to build and improve relations with both Russia and China. Yeah, well, I, um, I have a lot of problems with Russia. Um, but. Notwithstanding that, I mean, we need to talk to them about uh, controlling our nuclear arsenals. And we shouldn't be backing out of treaties that give one side or the other a green light to be able to make, to produce more nuclear weapons. Um, you know, we can have disagreements on human rights and we can have disagreements on other things, uh, but still understand that we have some commonality. Um, survival on this planet should be first and foremost. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't advocate ever cutting off discussions, um, you know, with Russia or, or China or anybody else. I mean, we need, to, we need to engage. We need to find out, especially on these security issues, how we can cooperate, especially on how we end wars, whether the, the war in Syria, for example, that has killed so many people. How do, we, how do we come to some sort of common ground, you know, to help stop, you know, the killing that's going on in Syria? And Russia, can, Russia quite frankly, can play a major role in that. You know, how do we move forward uh, on, uh, on dealing with some of the you know, the, uh, you know the, the climate change crises that are affecting the entire world. On China, the same thing. I mean, I, you know, and I think as, for, as, as politicians, and I, I co-chair not only the Human Rights Commission, I, I also co-chair the uh, Ex Executive Congressional Com Commission on China. So, um, and I remind people all the time that, you know, when we talk about human rights abuses in China, um, for example, or Russia or any place else, we're, we're talking about abuses by, the, by individuals in the government. That our fight is not with the Chinese people, our fight is not with the Russian people. I mean, that is not, and sometimes we tend to blur it all together, that we're against China, we're against Russia, whatever. No, even in terms of sanctions, I don't believe in, in blanket sanctions against Russia or China. I mean, I, I'm the author of the Magnitsky Act, right, which is targeted at individuals that we know who have been involved in serious corruption or who have been involved in murder um, or human rights violations. Uh, the people who should be held accountable are the people who do bad things, not innocent people, not the general population. And I also believe that, that, you know, that, that human rights have, has to be the centerpiece of our foreign policy. I, you know, I, I, I really believe that. And that means that we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, but we cannot be shy about raising these issues. Um, you know, the people around the world actually expect us to be their voice. Uh, and I've been to a lot of countries since this president got elected, and people, human rights defenders, are at, coming up and saying, do, do you no longer care? Um, we're, we, we, Trump administration becomes so transactional that human rights doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what Saudi Arabia does. What matters to Trump is they'll buy our weapons. Yeah. You know, I mean, and China, we, yeah, we, we need to work a, a, a deal on trade that, quite frankly, you know, is fair. So, but, but you know, and, um, 
And, and China, by the way, is not going to be bullied by Trump's tariffs. I mean, they, you know. But anyway, we need to work on somebody's fit. But that doesn't mean that as we do that, we don't talk about the plight of the Uyghurs or what's happening to Tibetans, which is horrific um, by any measure. So, you know, um, human rights somehow has gotten disconnected from our our foreign policy, and it, and it troubles me greatly. You know, even this immigration battle we're having in Washington on the border, you know, we could talk all we want about the border, right? But the reason why people are at the border is because what's happening in El Salvador and what's happening in Honduras, I've been there, right? I've seen what's going on. I mean, it's, it's more dangerous in some cases than Afghanistan right now. Um, and I always tell people, I, I, I'm coming to you now after doing three mini town halls uh, in some of my uh, my towns, some of them are pretty conservative towns, the issue of immigration gets brought up. And I say to the people who are, you know, a agitating on this issue, look, anybody here who's a parent, you know, would feel the same way as so many who are fleeing El Salvador and Honduras are. If somebody were, were to threaten my daughter or my son, if I thought if they remained where they are, they would be killed, you could bet your life I would do everything humanly possible to get them the hell out of there. And by the way, the U.S. law is that if you come to the border and you ask for asylum, you know, you are entitled to have your case heard. So us turning people back is a, is a violation of our law. It's a violation of international law. It is a human rights violation. Separating children from their parents and not knowing where their parents are if you separated them, that's a human rights violation. And if it were happening in any other country, we'd be asking the United Nations to do an investigation. And so, I mean, so human rights has to re-enter our conversation as being front and center. No. Thank you. Um, thank you for all thank you. you do. My name's Eileen Krakowski. I'm part of a no-drug group in the Boston area, and we recently had 80, 80 people show up for uh, talking about anti-weapons, nuclear, and no drones, uh, and I was pretty impressed. Even some um, students on the campus have started a no drone policy, which is the first they've actually been walking the, the campus. My question is, fantasy, a hope, how can we eat, make drone attacks illegal. Mm -hmm. We've got attacks on people who are allegedly our enemies. I'm questioning that and a lot of women and children getting hurt for too long. Right. So, you know, I don't know, um, you know, uh, in the short term, like what it is, you know, how we stop it. I mean, I guess, you know, what I, you know, what I always, what I remind people is that, um, you know, that, you know, a lot of the men and women who serve in our military who are battling with, you know, post-traumatic stress are not just people on the front line, they're the people who are operating some of these drones because they know what's going on. So we can try to distance ourselves from, you know, what, what happens when we drop a bomb here if we don't see it. The, the, the people, people feel it, they know, they know what's going on. Uh, and, you know, we have gotten too comfortable uh, waging war against people with drones, um, and um, and a lot of innocent people have been have been killed in the process. Um, and I think um, I think there needs, at a minimum, to be more accountability and more control over what we're doing. Um, look, I you know I I'm, I'm somebody I, I have this belief that you know we we can get to a world where where we all get along and we we can actually move away from violence and war and you know and it's kind of an idealistic uh, view but um, but I think um, I think the innocent casualties uh, as a result of our drone wars are uh, you know are, are something that should concern every one of us and so you know at, 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 you know I've, I've talked to the chairman of the Armed Services Committee that we ought to be doing hearings on like getting the facts out what is happening what is the how do we know you know how do we account for uh, those who were killed in drone attacks. Uh, you know, we, we, how many misfires have we had? How many mistakes have been made? We, we occasionally read about them in the New York Times um, when something particularly egregious happens or when they happen in an area where reporters have access to. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, I think it's a legitimate issue and I, I, I'm not quite sure how we, it's, it's tough to put the genie back in the bottle when we end up unleashing these things. 
Uh, that's why we ought to be rejecting the president's call to um, launch the arms race into outer space. You start doing that, it's endless, right? So let's not, let's not get there. Let, let, let's take preemptive action. I'm also, we ought to be talking about right now, we talk about drones now, we ought to be talking about killer robots. I mean, because that's the next thing, where you're going to have these, this technology where there's no man in the loop or woman in the loop, um, and it just responds based on kind of artificial intelligence, you know? And it's something that they're doing a lot of research on right now. And I'm like, no, no, right? And we ought to be talking about it now. Yeah. It's a lot easier to prevent things before they happen, right? Before they become, before they're utilized than it is to go back and take something away. Russ. Congressman, uh, oh, I was okay. oh, yeah. okay. good to see you again. Um, I was part of the breakout uh, group on Venezuela, and we know that you're against the idea of regime change in Venezuela. We know that the uh, Trump administration, our government, are sort of pushing ahead as fast as they can go um, to change that regime down, um, down there. As we were talking, that a lot of us, myself included, are, are afraid of a Chilean um, response after regime change, death squads and whatever, to try to really take apart that society. There's also there's a lot of frustration as to how we can play a role in stopping the U.S. government from changing the regime, change the regime in Venezuela. I wonder if you have any advice as to how's the best to impact that policy in the Well, one is we need to pass the bill that was marked up um, in, for, in uh, foreign affairs um, that Congressman Cicilline introduced to say that you, the United States cannot, uh, is not authorized to use military force in, in Venezuela, you know, uh, unless Congress approves it. Um, I mean, that's number one. Uh, we have to be vigilant that the administration is not involved with some kind of covert operation, um, arming militias in Venezuela. Uh, we, um, you know, uh, we're going to do a briefing in um, in D.C. Uh, with some experts to talk about the impact of blanket sanctions uh, on the people of Venezuela. Uh, because quite frankly, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not Maduro or the government that are hurting. It is it's regular people, right, that are hurting because of these sanctions. Um, and, um, and, you know, we have been receiving testimonies from people whose families are there who are talking about the lack of access to food and medicine and and you know a whole range of things, and so you know, and I think that um, you know we have some people in the White House right now who you, whose names you have recognized from past administrations. I mean, these are the, these are people who are nostalgic for the Cold War. They're 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 mad that they didn't overthrow Cuba. They're mad that they didn't, I mean they're mad that they didn't succeed when they were there during the Reagan years, and now they're coming back like the creature of the Black Lagoon comes back, right? It just never goes away. And they're insisting that, you know, that this is my, my next, you know, oh, this is my next opportunity to get what I want. Well, we saw what happened um, the other day. I mean, you know, I mean, they were so cocky and confident that the government was to be overthrown. They're all tweeting and high-fiving each other. Well, it didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. Um, and look, I'm going to be very honest with you. I've had this conversation with Cole. I'm not a big fan of Mr. Maduro. Um, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, uh, you know, um, because some of the economic problems are even before the, uh, the, the sanctions, the, I would argue some mismanagement of the economy, and I also worry about the crumbling uh, human rights situation there. But having said that, um, it is not up to the United States to say this is who your government should be. It is not up to us to say, you know, we don't longer recognize you as president, we're going to, Mr. Guaido will be the new president, or, or to say we, I mean, that's just, I mean, that, this, is, this is not the way we should go. And just, I always tell people who kind of, you know, who, who will question me on that, I'll say, you know, look back, all you need to do is read history. You know, current, recent history. I mean, every time the United States has tried to get involved in any place in Latin America or South America militarily, it has blown up in our face. It's been a disaster. Um, I was in Cuba a few weeks ago. I met with President Diaz-Canal to talk about a role that potentially Cuba can play in trying to get us out of this mess. And the reason why I said that is because Cuba played a very constructive role in the Colombia peace negotiations. Uh, but also at the time to talk about getting the Maduro government to agree 
to allowing the UN World Food Program and the International Committee for the Red Cross to bring food into Venezuela, uh, which they have agreed to do, uh, and that is good. So that provides some relief to some of the people there. But we should never use food as a weapon. And when, when Trump brought all these, all the food to the, to, the, to the border, I mean, even the International Committee of the Red Cross said, we don't want anything to do with it, because we do not weaponize food. Do not politicize food. We start doing that, boy, you're opening up a Pandora's box that is going to be very, 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 very dangerous uh, in the future. So, you know, um, so I think, you know, I, I, so I think what we have to do is just constantly focus attention on, you know, no military intervention. We, are, we, we need to help educate people about the impact of the blanket sanctions. Because I don't think most, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think most members of Congress know what's, you know, what the, sanc the sanctions have, what, what, the impact the sanctions have had. Um, and there's some, you know, Jeffrey Sachs just came out with a new report. I mean, I'm trying to get him to come down, a few others, to basically, you know, to talk about, you know, this is what we know. Um, you know, and again, if, you, if you've got a problem with an individual, fine. You know, you say you can't hide your money in a U.S. bank, or you can't, you know, come here and go to Disney World or whatever. But you don't take it out on, on people who mostly are poor um, and, um, you know, who are suffering greatly because of this. So, um, uh, so my hope is the Cicilline bill will come to the floor for a vote. Um, I don't know where the votes are, all right? Um, and that's the thing I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. We, I don't have a whip count. I will tell you this, uh, that some have, are trying to Cubanize the Venezuela issue. Um, and so we have some Democrats from Florida and some other places that are, you know, it, 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 it's, like, it's, like, it's like a throwback to an old debate. Um, but, you know, this is an issue where you're going to have to make sure that everybody, you know, understands that if this comes for a vote, you better vote for the bill. Um, because if you don't, it basically is a license to the Trump administration. They could do whatever the hell they want to do. Hello from New Hampshire. Hey, how are you doing? Okay. My name's John Raby. I'm with the Nuclear Weapons Working Group in New Hampshire. And uh, I've got a proposition for you. Okay. Okay. We've been bird dogging presidential candidates that have been swarming over the Thank state. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I personally met seven. Now, of those seven, only one, Tulsi Gabbard, has made addressing nuclear arms race issues part of her stump speech. And uh, yet, in late February, the University of New Hampshire Survey Center did a voter survey and found that 84% of those surveyed wanted presidential candidates to address nuclear arms race issues. Now, uh, I'm going to ask a favor of you. Okay. You can say you heard from a guy in New Hampshire that folk there are interested in that. And every time you run across a presidential candidate, pass that word on. And if they say, how do you know that? You can say, guy from New Hampshire told me. Uh, if you would do that, I propose that it would not only further your work, but it would further the work of everybody else in this room. Because our aim in bird dogging these folk is to make sure that no presidential candidate can escape right, addressing these issues. Uh, the second thing on, uh, on climate change, do you know who Edward Cameron is? He's one of the authors of the Paris Climate Accord. He's a friend of mine. What about bringing him to Congress to testify? I think that'd be a good idea. Uh, okay, I'll give you his name. Right, give me his name. But here, here, here's, here's what we gotta do. We gotta, we gotta make sure that the committees of jurisdiction are willing to do hearings. Um, and um, you know, we might have to think creatively about how we can utilize the Rules Committee again. But I think the, the deal is, is that, you know, I mean, you know, I, here's one of my frustrations right now is that, you know, people, the, uh, the other side is very good about rapid response. So yeah. when the Green New Deal comes out, you're all socialists, you're this, you're that, you want to ban hamburgers, you don't want planes to fly anymore, all that kind of stuff. So sometimes Democrats, and I'm a Democrat, we all, I love, our, right? We, so people get a little defensive, say, well, maybe we should back off. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it that much. Look, at, we need to lean in on this issue because we're running out of time. And I think, you know, I think having hearings is a way to do it. That hearing in the Rules Committee, that hearing in the Rules Committee said, prompted the Budget Committee to say, well, we're going to do a hearing. Um, it then prompted a bunch of people to go see Congressman Neal and say, if, you know, if the Rules Committee can do a hearing, you should do a hearing because Ways and Means is part of it. And he said, yeah, I'll do a hearing. Um, and then we, you know, and Energy and Commerce is next. 
so, you know, sometimes when you, you know, you talk about these things and the sky doesn't fall in and people say, hey, that makes a lot of sense, then it makes it eat the comfort level for others to follow is good. And on the nuclear stuff, I agree with you. I will, I'm going to obviously see Seth Moulton when he votes and I'm going to see Elizabeth Warren. I see her all the time. And we're going to tell you, you know, these, these issues ought to be, you know, front and center of your campaign, as well as other issues. You know, I do a lot of work on hunger and food insecurity. I mean, there are you know, 40 million people in this country who don't know where the next meal is going to come from. And it's never talked about. No one ever talks about it. Um, and yet, we have Congress that, that, and the administration keeps on trying to chip away at SNAP, food stamps, which is now about $1.40 per person per meal. No one talks about it. We, these issues, we've we got to force them. And you keep on showing up, and I will pass on that I heard from New Hampshire, and they want you to make this <laughs> primary. You right? Who's, who's that? Edward Cameron. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Congressman, we have time for one or two more. Let's see. Congressman Cameron? Yes, I'd like to thank you very much for what you do. I don't think we can thank you enough because you are one of our heroes. My staff's only a bad time. I just became a chairman of the committee. <laughs> Town halls, big town halls, small town halls, and, and the issue kept on being brought up. Uh, and, you know, other than I can raise more money, there was really no reason to, you know, to, to say no, I'm, that I want to continue to, to take PAC, uh, corporate PAC money. Look, I, I, I think people have to make their own minds up and if you do what they feel is comfortable. I just, look, I, 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 I I'm, when I've been coming to, appreciate is that it's not just, you know, uh, what we do in Washington, or whether we bring up these amendments or we bring up this or that, that matters. It's the perception that people have of the institution. And, you know, I, I don't think to say that everybody who takes corporate PAC money is absolutely in the bag with corporations, but there's a perception, right? And if people have that perception, it erodes people's confidence in government. Uh, it erodes people's belief that you're actually on their side and uh, side something else. So, I mean, I'm not judgmental of people who take corporate PAC money. I think for me, it just was like, I mean, I don't really have a good answer to say I'm gonna continue to do it. Um, I, I, you know, and, and if the perception of my constituents was that I'm tainted by taking it, you know what, let me just ease your mind. It's just easier, right? And we don't have to talk about it. We can then talk about other things. And, you know, um, and I think people have been genuinely receptive uh, and, you know, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, I raise a lot more like small dollar contributions, um, and I think if you know, I, if I, I end up in a difficult campaign, you know, I'll do what I got to do to raise money, but I don't need to take corporate PAC money. Um, and uh, on the issue of, you know, on, on defense money, I mean, look, I've, I've had defense contractors give me money over the years. Um, and I always tell people that, you know, they're not getting a good return on their investment because I usually vote against the defense budget, right? But if the perception is, you know, that maybe, you know, I'm not doing something because of that, you know, I, I just, it's not worth it. I, I, I want, I don't, I don't need it. So I, um, so anyway, it's, but and other members, you, you got to have to talk to them and see what, what their comfort level is. Jim, Jim. my question is, about process and medical viewpoint. My name is Janice Weary, and this is really important to me. So about process and mental viewpoint, not about a particular candidate. I think every one of us here in this room agrees that every Democratic candidate is better than Trump. So it seems to me there's two approaches we can take. I watched last election many of my really good friends in this room voted for their idea, Green Party, Socialist, etc. I think there's another way to vote, and I want your opinion about this, and that is, what's the strategic viewpoint, what's the mental attitude we should take to get rid of Trump? My sense is, 
where I need to that we really need to look at which candidate will make Republicans cross over to our side and bring in independents, regardless of the idea. So here's my viewpoint. Um. I, I think primaries are a time that you vote for what you feel in your heart. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, I, you know, Joe Biden's ahead in the polls right now, and maybe he continues to be ahead in the polls, but I don't know what happens tomorrow, right? I don't know if, you, you just don't know. So primaries are a time when you can, you, you express your, you know, what's in your heart and soul. And, you know, I've voted for, can I've supported candidates in the past who are a million to one shot. People say, you're crazy. As you know, because the more my candidate gets votes, the more that eventual nominee will be, will move in that direction. I ran George McGovern's campaign in 1984 after he, you know, he came back because he was talking about cutting the military budget then by 25 percent. He's the only one doing it, uh, and you know, he made this plea: "Don't throw away your conscience." So I believe that. So we we can't. We're, this is not a horse race, right? Not the Kentucky Derby where you put a bet on your on a horse to win. This is this is about what you believe. So I think people if you if you like Bernie, then vote for Bernie. If you like Tulsi, vote for Tulsi. I'm with Elizabeth. But you know, I was at a forum at UMass Amherst the other day and someone said, "Okay, what if Elizabeth doesn't win?" And here's where I think that it we have to make sure we are together. Who's your second candidate? I said my second candidate is Unity. I mean, I don't. I mean, I will be honest with you. I mean, I you know, I have my preferences, but I'd rather fight with the most conservative Democrat in the field that have to deal with in, in, on, on issues of arms control and on issues of peace and justice than fight with this administration who doesn't give a damn what I think or doesn't care about any of the priorities that I care about. I think our failure in the last election uh, was that we weren't all together. We were not at the end. It, it, there was too much division still within the ranks of the Democrats, and I think it was a monumental and colossal mistake for people not to support Hillary at the end. I just really do. She's not perfect, you know what? But I'll tell you, I work with her on, you know, on projects to 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 to, um, to expa expand, you know, global hunger initiatives all around the world. Millions of people are being fed because of her efforts, and now I'm dealing with a guy who wants to cut it all back. So yeah, you know, primaries get out there and fight for what you believe because it will either your candidate will win and we'll all get behind him or her, or if your candidate loses, the bigger that vote, the more that eventual nominee, be it Joe Biden or somebody else, will move in that direction. But then when it's over, we got to be together because failure is not an option. I'm not only worried about wars. I'm not only worried about you know uh, you know the increase in bigotry and racism in this country that's coming out of this president's mouth every single day of the, of the year. I am also worried about the institutions of this country crumbling. I mean, you know, we used to say freedom of the press was sacrosanct. It's under threat. Checks and balances, you know, based on the Constitution. This guy is ignoring the Constitution. And by the way, he packed the Supreme Court in a way where they might side with him on some of this stuff. I mean, this man is dangerous. This man is doing great harm to this country and to the world. And I, you know, we, I, my daughter, if my daughter were here, she's 17, she, she says, and dad, this is when you say, this is not who we are. And I say, I say that all the time. But then she, she's been asking me, what happens if he gets reelected? Is that who we are? And the answer is, if he gets reelected, it is. Because we know who he is. Last time around, people had all kinds of rationalizations to vote for him. Oh, he's, he's all, you know, bluster. That's not who he is. Oh, he's much more reasonable. He's, like, he's worse. He's worse. Uh, and um, and I, I just, uh, this is, failure is not an option here. So primary, I don't think anybody, we all can, none of us can handicap this race. None of us know who's going to be the nominee. None of us know, what, you know, what will happen. My view is vote for who you believe is the best. And then if your candidate wins, I'll be there. And if my, if my candidate wins, you'll be there. But if some other candidate wins, we're all there. That's the bottom line. Is this on? Yeah, okay. So I'd like to say, two like to questions. give. I'll take two more. No, we're going to wrap uh, okay. because we do have to go on to another topic. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to Jim McGovern for joining us today. and for helping to move the peace and progressive agenda in Washington. Thank you, Jim.